tell you what, my arm is open packing stuff yesterday on that. That's a long story, but I have no strength in it. It's hard to make a cord. Good morning. All right. Why don't we start off in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made, Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit just have full reign over the congregation. And may your good and pleasing and perfect will be done. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, this first song is almost a hymn, Pass Me Not. And one thing we're guaranteed in life, and that is you're going to have some hardships. Sooner or later, uh, we hope that they're not as bad as what Job is going through, but they might come and will come. And a lot of times you wonder, you know, where are you, Lord? I could use you. And uh, are you there? Don't pass me by, Lord. But he never does. I read the, I skipped ahead and read the last book of uh, the last chapter of Job, <clears throat> and he did not pass him by, and he never does, okay, stand with us, <clears throat> pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art smiling, do not pass me by Savior Savior hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by let me at thy throne of mercy Find a sweet relief Kneeling there in deep contrition Help my unbelief Savior, Savior Hear my humble cry While on others thou art Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. And we know that he doesn't. All right, this next song reminds me of an incident. I'm going to tell you a little story. Take one minute. Um, I have a jail ministry. I've had it for, <laughs> Pam knows where I'm going here. She was a correctional officer at the time. Um, had it for 28 years. And so I recall the very first service I did at the jail, Siskiyou County. There was a, this one we do several services. It's one female service. There was a, a Hispanic lady there. It was very helpful. She was pleasant and uh, actually helped another Hispanic lady that couldn't understand English. She interpreted the word to her, and she ended up giving her heart to the Lord. So actually, this Mary had something to do with that. And so after the services, I asked Ron. Ron Henson was a chaplain then, still is. So... Uh, 
what was Mary in here for? You know, I thought some minor. Well, she had her husband shot in the head at 45 uh, to collect insurance money. Don't get any ideas, ladies. She got caught, okay? <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> I thought, whoa, I didn't expect that. I thought, man, she seemed so pleasant and, and, and helpful. Doesn't seem like the type. And Ron says, well, what you're seeing is the new Mary. You see, the old Mary, she came to a service <coughs> several weeks ago, and uh, she, started, she sat down, I started preaching, Ron started preaching, I wasn't there, and she started screaming. And Ron and Don, another elder that was with Ron, she got settled down, and Ron asked her, are you into witchcraft? She said, yes voodoo, black magic, and, and a bunch of other stuff, all, all of her life, most of her life. <clears throat> she was tormented, she said. Is there anything you can do? So <clears throat> Ron and Don laid hands on her, <clears throat> and in the name of Jesus, cast out the evil spirit, and she was filled with God's Holy Spirit. That's what I saw, the new Mary. Pam remembers the old Mary. <laughs> she told me some stories. <laughs> so the, the, my point is, though, <clears throat> is what she said on her last Sunday service before she went to Chowchilla, uh, a women's prison for life. And she was sentenced to life in prison. She said, I have been in a prison all of my life. But now that I'm going to a prison for life, for once I've been set free. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> it, um, you know, it's, not many people are sentenced to life in prison filled with joy. Uh, what Jesus said, you know, in the book of John, when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Amen. It doesn't matter where you're going or where you've been. Alone in my sorrows and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested in my life began oh your grace so washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins
our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven was lost. But then Jesus rode with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When was arrested and my life began when death was arrested and my life began amen that's good that's a good song we're going to sing psalm 36 it talks about god's <clears throat> love his faithfulness his righteousness and his justice Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain oh your justice flows the ocean's tide and i will lift my voice to worship you my king and i will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Yes, Lord, we thank you for your love, for your faithfulness, your righteousness, your justice. You are, that's who you are, Lord, the epitome of all. Thank you. In your name, Jesus, amen.
All right, well, good morning. Welcome. Good to see you guys, as always. Hey, before we get going, a couple things, a couple announcements. Uh, first of all, we have a lot of stuff going on this summer, and uh, a, a lot of it's getting filled up. So uh, we have VBS coming up. Uh, spread the word about that. We have Burgers in the Bible coming up on Wednesday nights where we're going to grill some burgers before Bible study. Uh, we have a rafting trip coming up on the 18th of June. Uh, there's still some room there, but it's filling up quick. So if, if you guys want to do that, it's going to be a blast. We're actually going down to Happy Camp. We're going to raft a really cool portion of the Klamath River. We're going to raft the Dragon's Tooth. So it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, littles, I would say, I don't know, like six, seven, eight and up, probably below that, maybe questionable. Uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, you can sign up for that. And also family camp over at Kidder Creek. Man, it is going to be so much fun. It's so great to just Hit the pause button on life. Go to a place with people who are like-minded and love Jesus. And just, man, just be Christians. Uh, it, it really is a fun time. So we're going to do some horseback riding, pond time, archery, all sorts of fun stuff there. High ropes course. Uh, so sign up. Uh, you can sign up. There's good old-fashioned uh, sign-ups. And we also have uh, a church app. I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you guys uh, of the church app because it really is a super handy deal. Uh, you can download it on the, the church website. It's a third party, so it's a little bit wonky. It's not like going to, uh, you know, the App Store, the Apple provides, or uh, Android. But once you get it on your phone and you're logged in, man, it's fantastic. And, you know, you've got all the latest. You can get, you know, the signups for family camp and for rafting. Uh, there's a spot on here for uh, all the teachings. Well, you can scroll through all the teachings that are listed on there if you want to catch up or just study through something else. Uh, daily devotions. Uh, there's a church directory that we're going to update soon. Uh, but if you're like, man, I want to get a hold of someone, so a whole electronic directory uh, that you can find in there. And then one thing that uh, I would like to see us utilize more, uh, just as the pastor, uh, is the prayer request section. There's a section in here where you can just, man, if you're, you need prayer for anything, you can go in there and, and you can have your name attached to it. You can be anonymous. And it, it pings out. It goes to everybody if you have your notifications turned on. And the church says, hey, Please be praying about this. Super helpful thing. Uh, I would encourage you guys to take advantage of that. So lots of stuff coming up. Uh, get plugged in. Uh, sign up. Uh, last announcement is uh, you saw all of those awesome little people that were just in here. They went marching out like an army. They're headed over to the kids' wing to be loved on and to be taught about Jesus by some selfless volunteers. And uh, I just wanted to, to put the call out. We could use a couple extra volunteers over in the kids' wing. And I got to tell you, man, if, if the Lord has been just kind of calling you into service, I cannot imagine a better way to do it. Uh, the impact that you have on kiddos uh, in the name of Jesus to shape their worldview and to teach them just really about who Jesus is and let the Holy Spirit shape their worldview. It's so neat to, to teach kids about uh, the Lord. Uh, I was a little guy. I was eight years old when I gave my heart to the Lord, and I remember it clearly. I was in a Sunday school class, and this kind young lady, she went through the whole entire, uh, you know, gospel story. It was the flannel graph days where they had the little flannels, and, and she was just like, man, who wants to go to heaven? I was like, man, I want in. Jesus is my guy, and, and we have the opportunity to do that with our kids, so I would encourage you. You can sign up online or on the app uh, also. So, that's it for announcements. If you would, grab your Bibles, flip them open to Job chapter 33 as we continue making our way uh, just verse by verse and chapter by chapter uh, through the Bible. And so, uh, you know, Job here, boy, we've seen that he's really been going through it. You could say he's having the worst day ever, the worst week, really the worst month ever uh, Job is having. And, you know, in his sorrows in his distress. Boy, we've seen Job just really kind of feel like, man, I wish I had somebody in my corner. And maybe you felt like that in your life. Maybe you've gone through difficult situations, uh, a time of sorrow. Maybe you're going through something difficult even now. And you've just felt like, man, I wish I had somebody in my corner. I, I wish there was somebody who understood what I was going through. I wish there was somebody who was for me, somebody who was willing to help me out. Uh, again, Job, boy, he's no stranger to that feeling as he's gone through all of these difficulties. Job was the richest guy around, and he became the, the poorest man around. Job was the proud father of 10 awesome kids, and he buried every single one of them in a span of just one day. 
He went from a healthy, able-bodied man to somebody who was suffering and on the the brink uh, of death. He went from a man who was honorable. People, the Bible said, would drink Job's words in like the dry dirt when it rained. People were like, wow, Job, honorable man. He had a place of authority in the city council. And now he's a man that people literally, it says the youth, the punks of Job's day, would would just walk by and spit at Job. Uh, Job, man, he he just feels like he's been left all alone, like everybody's forsaken him. Well, surely Job's wife was there for him, right? Job's wife. But what do we know of Job's wife? She said, Job, just curse God and die. You know, okay, that was not helpful, Mrs. Job. Surely Job's friends will be there for him. As he saw his friends coming his way, he thought, ah, here come my buds. They know me. They'll offer me some some comfort, some compassion. But they didn't. Uh, Job called them uh, just miserable comforters. Uh, They accused Job more than brought comfort into Job's life. And so poor Job, his life is shaping up to be like a country western song. (laughs) He's lost everything. He's got nobody. He's got his back. But the worst of all is Job feels like God has forsaken him. Job feels like God has been afflicting him, that God has made an enemy of him. And everything that Job is going through, through his whole ordeal, through all of it, we have seen Job kind of have this longing for someone to just be there for him, to understand, to bail him out. He just wanted somebody to defend him. He wanted somebody to be a a mediator between him and God. Job just wanted somebody to to set the record straight as he's being accused of all of these things. He just wanted somebody to help him out of his situation. And and we've seen Job uh, cry out to God for these things. In Job chapter 9, Job longed for an umpire, a, a referee. It says in Job 9.33, neither is there any daysman. Daysman is just a a fancy uh, King James way of saying umpire. Neither is there an umpire betwixt us, between me and God, that might lay his hand upon us both. Uh, A a mediator to settle our differences between me and God, Job would say, to defend me even really before God. Job just longed for that. Job longed for a witness, somebody to testify on his behalf. Uh, Job in Job 16 says, also now behold my witness in heaven and my record is on high. There's nobody here to defend me, but I know someday I'm going to have a witness in heaven. But he longed for a witness then and there to, to just testify on his behalf. Job longed for a redeemer. We looked at this in Job 19.25, one of the most profound verses found in all of Job, where Job says, for I know my redeemer lives and, and that he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. Job desired, he longed for a redeemer, somebody to rescue him, somebody to set the record straight and help him out of his situation, a mediator, someone who stands between us and God, a witness, someone to testify on our behalf, a redeemer, someone to rescue us from our situation. You guys putting the pieces together? This sound like somebody we know? As somebody whose name starts with a J and ends with a Jesus, it sounds a lot like Jesus to me, right? And, and so that's it. Here in chapter 33, we have this man named Elihu who is, he's speaking of something that is beyond his understanding. He's speaking of something that has uh, been inspired in him by the Holy Spirit. And Elihu, he's going to describe this mediator, this witness, this redeemer. Elihu is going to give us a description of Jesus, a description of Jesus's ministry that is just shockingly accurate uh, and with much detail. And something I want you to keep in mind as we kind of unpack just a few verses is that as Elihu kind of describes, alludes to Jesus and his ministry, this was 2,000 years before Jesus was even born. It really is uh, pretty interesting. And you guys have heard me Uh, talk about the scarlet thread. If you've been here for long, you know, I I mention it. And and what is the scarlet thread? The scarlet thread is a theme that runs through the Bible from cover to cover. It's the theme, uh, it's the story of of Jesus 
how he has redeemed mankind, how he's rescued us from our sinful ways by the shedding of his innocent blood. Uh, the blood of Jesus runs through the Bible from cover to cover symbolically. And it started in the very beginning. Remember, God created everything. It was perfect. It was fantastic. There was no poison oak. There were no thorns. It was just God, the garden, and man. But man sinned. And when man sinned, uh, you know, hardship and sorrow and death entered into humanity. And it was in that moment when Adam and Eve sinned, they, they understood some things that they shouldn't. And they recognized that they were naked. And what did they do? They made themselves like loincloths out of fig leaves. Maybe you've seen the artist's depiction of Adam and Eve with a little fig leaf. Well, what did God do? He came along and said, wait a second, who told you you were naked, first of all? And second of all, he made for them what? Uh, clothes from lambskins. He said, give me that itchy fig leaf. I'm going to give you some nice lambskin underoos there that will be more comfy. But that took the sacrifice of an animal. And so from the very beginning, we see sin required the sacrifice to be made. And, and that theme, it continues on. Think about the story of Abraham, another Bible story. Abraham had this promised son, Isaac. But God called Abraham to sacrifice his son, to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him, to prove his love to God. You say, well, that's harsh. And as Abraham is making his way up the mountain with his son, Isaac, who is not a little kid, he's like 30 at this point, Isaac begins to put the pieces together. He says, wait a second, Dad, we've got all of the makings for a sacrifice, but where's the actual animal to be sacrificed? And you guys remember what Abraham said? He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. He will provide himself a lamb. The picture of that sacrifice. And then the Passover. We've studied through the Passover extensively whereby the children of Israel were instructed to slaughter a lamb and apply that blood to their lives, whereby they would experience freedom from oppression and life anew. Uh, we see the scarlet rope of Rahab. When Rahab was marked, she, she, she was marked with the scarlet thread that she was protected. And it goes on and on through the thousands of years of sacrifices in the temple into the New Testament. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus on the cross, when he cried out, it is finished all the way to the very end. When we see Jesus coming back, his second advent, Jesus is coming back someday to make things right, to establish his kingdom on this earth. But there's a description of Jesus there in Revelation 19 when he comes back that his eyes are afire and, and he's riding on this white horse and we're with him. And it says that his vesture is dipped in blood. In that picture, that scarlet thread that runs through the Bible uh, from cover to cover. And as we look at this passage, that's what we find. It's that uh, alluding to that picture of Jesus and his ministry. But again, 2,000 years before Jesus was born. And I might just be geeking out on this, but this blows me away. Uh, and as we get into this, it really is interesting. And so if you're here on Wednesday night, we covered this already, but we covered it briefly. Uh, you know, I often do this to myself. I, I just bite off more than I can chew, and I'm trying to make some tracks through the scriptures. And uh, we got to this point, and I kind of rushed through it. And I thought, well, you know, we covered it. I'll just, I'll expand on this the next time we're in Job. And I started doing the math. Uh, that's going to be like 15 years at the, the rate that we're going. I mean, we might be in heaven, most of us. Hopefully all of us. Hopefully the Lord comes back. So I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to take some time. We're going to go back, and we're going to cover this uh, in depth. So we're going to be in Job chapter 33, and we're going to be starting uh, in verse uh, 23. But before we get going too far, uh, just bring us up to speed with the story that's taking place in Job. So Elihu is the man that we're going to be hearing from. And so for 30 chapters, 30-some-odd uh, chapters, the bulk of Job, uh, we've read about Job and his friends having this argument. Uh, Job's friends saying, Job, you've lost everything, and your life is miserable because you have some hidden sin, and God is punishing you. And Job's saying, ah, oh, wait a second, no, it's not me. No, I, I, I actually am upright and just before the Lord. Uh, I don't know what's going on. So we have this argument going on. Job's friends, uh, you've done wrong. That's why you're getting uh, punished. Job's saying, no, listen, I'm upright before the Lord. I don't know what's going on. And so Elihu, for these 30 some odd chapters, Elihu has been listening 
uh, as this conversation has been taking place. And he's been just waiting to give everybody a, a, a piece of his mind. He's mad at Job because he thinks Job is being self-righteous. He's mad at Job's friends because he thinks Job's friends have judged uh, Job without any proof of his wrongdoing. And so where Job's friends have said, Job, your uh, life is a disaster because of your sin. Uh, Elihu shows up on the scene and he says, Job, your life is a disaster because God is keeping you from your sin. And he begins to lay out his kind of uh, idea of what Job is going through and saying that sometimes God allows difficulties in our life to keep us from total and utter destruction. And Elihu describes this person who has been warned of God in dreams. This man who has been warned of God uh, by his circumstances. A, a man who is uh, really on the brink of being given over to the consequences of his sin. A man who is on the brink of experiencing total and utter destruction uh, and a man who, as Elihu says, is headed for the pit, who's headed for hell, a man who is hopelessly lost. But now in this section that we're going to look at, he begins to say, but if there was a way, if there was somebody who could help this man out, who could save him, if there was somebody, and we know that who that somebody is, right? Who is that somebody? Jesus. And he's going to lay this out. Of course, he didn't know that, right? We're looking back with much more clarity than he had. But before we dive into this picture of Jesus, this ministry of Jesus, I, I want us to understand something. I want us to hit the pause button and, and remember that this lost person, this hopelessly lost individual who is headed for destruction that uh, Elihu is describing, uh, that's us. That's humanity. That's our fallen nature. Every single one of us has sinned, and the wages of our sin is death. That's what the Bible says. And so as we look at this story, it's less about Job this morning, and it's more about us. This is our story. This is our story of redemption, how we were lost and how we are now found, how we were guilty and we've been now forgiven, how we were at odds with God and now we're at peace with God because of the work of the cross because of Calvary. And so let's dive into our text here uh, before I'm out of time. <laughs> uh, Job chapter 33, verse 23. Elihu says, if there be a messenger with him, uh, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his righteousness, his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him and saith, deliver him from getting down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child, and he shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see the light. So Elihu starts out this section by describing this one, if there was one somebody, if there was a messenger. Now, what is a messenger? Maybe your translation says angel. Uh, who is uh, Elihu referring to? Who is this angel that Elihu is referring to? Now, some suggest that Elihu is referring to himself, that Elihu shows up on the scene, that he has heard Job's cry for a mediator and, and for a witness, and he's like, all right, Job, I'm here. I'm going to be your guy. I'm going to stand between you and God. But as you study through it, that becomes uh, painfully obvious. That's not what is going on. There have been others who suggest that this is just uh, an average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill angel. Like if there could be such a thing. Like when I think of angel, I don't think of ordinary and run-of-the-mill. If I saw an angel, I'd go, whoa, that is definitely not ordinary. But they say that this phrase, one of a thousand, is just one of many common. But we'll talk about how that is just the opposite uh, case. But as we study through this little section here in Job, it becomes increasingly uh, apparent, it becomes increasingly clear that this is not a mere man, that this is not a, a, a mere angel. Who is it then? And in order to kind of decipher that, we need to take all of the Bible into context. And as you study through the Old Testament, there are these instances in which uh, this phrase appears, uh, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Now, uh, we don't know exactly who the, the angel of the Lord is. The Bible doesn't come out and say it, but it gives us lots of clues. It comes close to saying it. 
And uh, we see throughout the Bible that there's mentioned angels of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord. And it seems when the definite article the is used in front of angel of the Lord, that it's speaking of uh, something higher than the angels, uh, something uh, of more value, uh, of higher authority spiritually than just a normal angel. Again, there I say normal angel. Uh, But the angel of the Lord, as we see the different instances in the Old Testament where this angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord is mentioned, uh, it's always uh, identifying himself uh, with God, uh, always exercising the responsibilities and attributes of God. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. So Exodus, it's a well-known Bible story. Uh, Remember when Moses, he had spent 40 years on the backside of the desert and the Lord was calling Moses into service. And as Moses was hanging out there, he saw this burning bush. And it says in Exodus 3, chapter, or chapter 3, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire and out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So this angel of the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush. And remember, it called Moses' name, Moses, Moses. And Moses was like, whoa, what's going on? He shows up and has this conversation, and in verse 6 of Exodus 3, it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And they have this discussion whereby God, through this burning bush, says, I've seen the affliction of my people. Remember, Israel was in slavery to Egypt at the time. And Mo, I'm going to use you to deliver him. And Moses is like, whoa, not me. I can't do it. And basically, Moses says in verse 13, unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? Uh, When the people ask me, God, who sent me, what am I going to tell them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you unto me. Interesting. I am that I am. Now, remember, think back with me to the New Testament. In John, we covered it not too long ago. When Jesus is having this discussion with the Pharisees, he said, oh, yeah, I knew Abraham. And like, wait a second. Pause, Jesus. Time out. You're not even 50. You weren't alive when Abraham was around. And you remember what Jesus said? Before Abraham was, I am. I am. So this interesting, uh, uh, you know, picture of the uh, angel of the Lord. And then again, Another uh, popular or uh, well-known Bible story, the story of Gideon. Gideon was the one who was hiding down in the the wine press, threshing wheat because he was afraid of the invaders that were round about him. And it says uh, there in uh, Judges 6, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree, which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Ab, Ab, Abzerite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And I won't get into all of the ins and outs of this story, but basically this angelic being, the angel of the Lord, shows up to Gideon and says, Hey, Gideon, I want you to deliver your people from the Midianites. Gideon says, I can't do that. I'm the least. God, would you give me a sign? Would you wait here until I bring back some goat stew and some bread? Goat stew does not sound good to me. I'm just saying. But the angel of the Lord agreed. And when Gideon brought the stew back, the angel was set it on the rock and it consumed it with fire. And Gideon, he made an altar there and he called the altar Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah meaning God, Shalom meaning peace. Now, in Isaiah, Jesus is referred to as the prince of what? Peace. It's just very interesting. As you take and you survey the entire scripture, you begin to connect these dots. And so as Elihu is saying, boy, if there was only an angel, only a messenger, well, it's not just any messenger. It's not just any angel. And, you know, we can talk about whether this was a theophany in the Old Testament with the angel of the Lord or a Christophany. Either way, boy, it is very interesting that Elihu says, boy, if there was only one, and that one is God. And he begins to describe this one Uh, as one in a thousand there in verse 23. One in a thousand. Now, one in a thousand uh, means uh, that there is none like him. It's not just one who's common. It's mean that there is one in a thousand. There's nobody like uh, this one angel. Now, who's that? That's Jesus. There is no one like our God. 
There isn't. Uh, the Bible declares that over and over again in Jeremiah 10, 6. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. In Exodus 15, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? In 1 Samuel 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. See, Jesus is unique. Jesus is special. There's nobody like Jesus. Why? You see, there's lots of other religions in this world. There are lots of other false gods. There are lots of people who practice and worship these other religions. But you see, all of these religions have one thing in common. They all say you must. You must work. You must strive. You must earn God's favor somehow by your good deeds. See, Jesus, Christianity, is completely different. It's completely unique. Jesus says not you must work. Christianity says the work is done. It is finished. And, and so, boy, one in a thousand, so unique uh, this one that Elihu describes as being able to rescue uh, Job. And he goes on to say that he is an, an interpreter, another picture of Jesus. Now, if you're reading the New King James or the ESV, I'm not sure what the NIV says, but most translations don't say interpreter, they say mediator. Now, Jesus is our mediator. That's what 1 Timothy 2.5 says. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So Jesus is our mediator. Fantastic. Uh, what does that even mean? What is a mediator? Uh, if you have been involved in any sort of court cases, especially, unfortunately, a family court, often there is a, a, a mediator. Uh, a mediator is one who works with both opposing sides to try to find a, a settlement, to try to uh, settle a, a, a dispute, to resolve uh, a, a dispute, really. And so you think about that. So Jesus is our mediator between God. Why do we need a mediator? Is there a dispute between mankind and God? Yes, there is. And that dispute is because of sin. You see, God hates sin. Uh, sin stands between us and God. It's that great barrier that stands between us and God. And who has sinned? The Bible says every single one of us. Every single person, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the penalty for sin is death. And there is nothing that you can do in your own efforts that would be sufficient to mediate between us and God. There's nothing. Uh, your best self on your best day, bringing your very best efforts, would be like filthy rags compared to to the righteousness of God. Uh, that's why we need a mediator. See, that's where our hope comes from. You say, boy, this whole idea of God being in opposition and everybody being sinners, it's not very nice, Pastor Jeremy. I, this is not a very uplifting message. Ah, but it is. See, we have hope because Jesus is our mediator. He mediates for us. He's our, our defense attorney. Right? Satan is known as what? The accuser. He goes before the throne of God, accusing the brethren, that's us, day and night, constantly saying, look at Pastor Jeremy. He thinks he's a holy roller up there teaching the Bible, but look at those thoughts. He was cranky. He said a curse word when he hit his thumb with a hammer. He kicked his dog when his dog chewed up the hose. But see, there's Jesus, our defense attorney, our mediator, saying, nope, 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 hey, listen, my client is innocent of all charges. That's been covered by the blood of the lamb. You see, and the reason that Jesus is able to do that is because he's mediating a new covenant. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. See, what was the first covenant? What was the original covenant between God and man? Absolute 100% obedience. This is the law. 
Don't step out of line or you're toast. But we couldn't keep that. The law was given to us to show us that we needed the next covenant, the second one, the greater covenant, which is who? Jesus. When Jesus instituted communion there in the upper room, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. See, just like it says there in Hebrews, that a death has occurred that redeems us from the transgression. See, we'll talk more about this whole idea of why Jesus is the one who can be our mediator uh, here in a minute. But Jesus is our mediator. He is our defense. That is good news. In verse 24, Elihu goes on to, to talk about this one, this messenger, this interpreter, this one in a thousand as being one who is gracious. Do you guys know that we're saved by grace? Uh, that's what it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That means that, that we have not been saved, that we've not been forgiven of our sins because we're good little boys and girls. We can't earn God's favor, but by grace. What is grace? It's been rightly said that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a good way to remember it. I, I've heard it said accurately that grace is unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God. Absolutely true. But what is grace? Justice, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve. You see, if I was driving down uh, the street, there's 20 mile an hour speed limit, but I decided to go 60 miles an hour. I don't do that. Don't worry. This is just hypothetical. <laughs> and I got pulled over and the police officer, boy, he just out of your car, hands up. And he cuffed me and he stuffed me and he threw me in jail. That's justice. That's what I deserve. Now imagine the same scenario, 60 and a 20 pulled over. Cop comes up, Pastor Jeremy, I'm disappointed in you, but I'm going to let you off with a warning. Hey, that's mercy. I didn't get what I deserved. JR over here saying, don't let me catch you going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> that's mercy. But imagine, same scenario, 60 and a 20 pulled over. Hey, Pastor Jeremy, I'm going to let you off. And here's a $50 gift certificate to McDonald's. Whoa, that's grace. That's getting what I don't deserve. That's grace way oversimplified, but that's grace. And here's the reality. What do we deserve from God? Punishment, death, hell. But we didn't get that. See, that's mercy. And that would be fantastic enough if it was like, all right, well, you deserve to be, you know, in, in torment for all of eternity, but I'm going to let you off the hook. Woo, dodge that bullet. Thank God for that. But he takes it a step further and says, not only are you not going to get punished for your sin, but I'm going to give you that which you don't deserve, eternal life and life abundantly in me. That's grace. That is what Jesus does for us. That is his graciousness. But what about justice? What about justice? Right? Because there's the part of us that says, hey, that guy who was going 60 in the 20, I, I want to see him cuffed and stuffed and thrown into jail. Uh, there is a price to be paid for sin. There's a part of us that longs for justice, and we get that from the Lord. So, so what's the deal? Does God just turn a blind eye to sin? Does he just wink at sin? How can God be both merciful and gracious and also a just God? And that's something that hangs us up. I, I have talked with men who have said, I cannot follow a God who would let a murderer off the hook, period. Like the story that JT told about Maria. Mary, Mary, the Lord knows who she is. <laughs> that how could she murder her husband for insurance money and then experience joy and freedom? I don't get that. Did God just turn a blind eye to sin? How can he be both just and gracious? Well, that's where the next part comes in. You see, Elihu goes on to say that, uh, that I have found a ransom. See, I have found a ransom. That word ransom literally means the price of a life. To atone for sin by the offering of a substitute. You see, God didn't turn a blind eye to our sin. He didn't turn a blind eye to my sin or yours. 
He can't. He's just. He's holy. He's altogether pure. And sin requires the penalty of death. It requires blood. We see it throughout all of the Old Testament. That's what the sacrificial system was about. The wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So again, I'll ask you, how can God be both just and gracious? Justice and mercy, they meet on the cross. You see, God didn't let you off the hook for your sin. He paid for your sin. He took the penalty of your sin. It was like if I was driving 60 and a 20, pulled over, cuffed, stuffed, and I'm standing before the judge crying. And the judge says, yeah, this is a bad crime, man. You've got to be punished. There needs to be punishment met out for this. But then he came down off the bench, and he went to jail, and I went free. See, that's what Jesus has done for us, because he died in my stead. Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't turn a blind eye to your sin. When you're forgiven, don't think that it was just freebie. It cost Jesus a lot. But Jesus, he's our ransom. Elihu goes on to, to describe what happens uh, when this person, there's been a ransom made. It says that he becomes fresher than a child, that he shall return to the days of his youth. Interesting that he would say that. Because what happens to us when we put our faith in the work of the cross? Uh, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We become regenerate. We become new. We become born again. If you've hung out with Christians, that phrase, born again, are you born again? When were you born again? It's something that we throw around. But what does it mean? And back when Jesus was on the earth, there was a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus. Nicodemus was a super religious dude. He knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. He was on the Jewish Supreme Court of his day that dealt with all religious things. And he came to Jesus and said, Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus was like, well, what? Like it short-circuited his mind. He's like, I'm an old dude. How can I be born again? But see, Jesus wasn't talking physically. We've all been born physically. That's why we need to be born again, not just born. We need to be born again spiritually. And there's something amazing that takes place when by faith we trust the Lord. We're born again. And that's what Elihu is describing here, this being born again. It, it's a mystery, uh, but it is absolutely uh, wonderful. And he goes on to describe this transaction as it takes place uh, there at the end of verse 26, uh, that he will render unto man his righteousness. That, 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 that this, this angel, this messenger, this deliverer who's being described will give unto man his own righteousness. Again, boy, what a picture of Jesus we have here in the Old Testament. Uh, my pastor, uh, you know, when I was going to church and not leading church, he used to have this phrase when he would talk about uh, what happened on the cross. He called it the, the great switcheroo. The great switcher, switcheroo would take place. That is, uh, Jesus, he was perfect. I, I sinned. But Jesus, he became our sin. He died as my substitute. He took my punishment so that we might take his reward. Do you guys understand that transaction that took place? He took our punishment. We get his reward. And that's a good stinking deal. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness in God, in Christ Jesus, basically. Uh, what a wonderful reality that is, the great switcheroo. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about forgiveness. Uh, there in uh, verse 27, that he looks upon men and any uh, that say, I have sinned, I have perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, and he will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life uh, will see the light. Wouldn't it be nice if when we were saved, when we made that commitment to Jesus, Lord, I, I believe what you've done, I, I want to be a Christian. Wouldn't it be nice in that moment if we just lost all appetite for sin? Like, woo, that's great. I never have the urge to lose my temper. I never have the, or the urge to do anything sinful. That's going to be the straight and narrow for me here on out. Let's go, baby. This is going to be great. But it's not that way. See, because we, for a season, are stuck in this 
this quandary, this conundrum, whereby we have a spirit, we're alive spiritually, and our spirit seeks after and longs for God. We have a carnal nature, which seeks after the things of this world and sin. And even Paul, who wrote a ton of the New Testament, he said this. He said, man, the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. And then the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, who will rid me of this body of sin and death? He, he understood what was, was going on. But you see, when we sin, and you will, even if you're a Christian, when we sin, is it over? Are you toast? Is God like, I gave you a chance and you blew it? No, we can come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Because sin is that thing that stands between us and God. As an unregenerate, unbelieving world, absolutely. But even as Christians, there are things that we can allow in our lives that are a hindrance to our walk and our growth in Jesus. But what a wonderful reality it is that all we have to do is say, Lord, I'm turning from that. I'm turning to you. And we can be forgiven and restored. And then lastly, uh, what Elihu says, as he's really just speaking uh, about the Messiah, a, a very messianic uh, passage here, is he talks about being brought from darkness to light. From darkness to light. And I love that. Because the truth is we were all bound for destruction. We were all bound for an eternity in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But now we're bound for glory. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Man, that's good. Uh, the world, it's a dark place. It really is. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian or a scholar to recognize that the world is a dark place. There's lots of heartache and sorrow and wickedness that takes place uh, in the world, but we don't have to walk in the darkness of this world anymore. Walk. We don't have to walk, not work. We don't have to walk in the darkness of this world. We are free to walk in the light of Jesus. Jesus says of himself in John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Man, isn't that good news? I'm so glad that, that we are no longer bound to our sinful nature. We're no longer slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to righteousness, the Bible says. And this idea of walking in the light speaks of relationship. And maybe you've heard, it's kind of cliche, but it's true uh, that I've heard, you know, Christianity, it's not about religion, it's about what? Relationship. And that is so true. One of the reasons that God saved us is so that we might be restored into a relationship with him. That's why he created us, to have fellowship with him. Think back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden before poison oak and thorns. <laughs> Think back. It was so wonderful. Before there was that sin and that brokenness of fellowship, what did it say? It said that Adam and Eve, they walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. Boy, how awesome is that? But you see, sin broke that fellowship. Uh, the, the sacrificial system, it, it kind of eased the estrangement, but it wasn't until Jesus died on the cross and the Holy Spirit was given that we could truly enjoy the relationship intimately with the Lord that he desires with us. And that is the thing that I want you guys to leave this place remembering today, it is that God is not some, you know, super amazing being who just floats around in space, who's completely disconnected from our reality, but he desires a relationship with us. He knows you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what makes you smile. He knows what makes you cry. He loves you and has a purpose and a plan for your life, and he desires that relationship. And from our perspective, that should blow us away. That the God who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke and set everything into motion, would desire a relationship with me. That moment by moment and day by day, I can be with the Lord through prayer. That I can come boldly before the throne of grace. And that he speaks to my heart and to yours also. 
all of the things that we strive for in this world that we think are going to bring us joy and peace, boy, they can't hold a candle to being in the presence of the Lord. It's so awesome. But once you have tasted and seen, boy, that the Lord is good, you don't want anything else. There's nothing else that will do. And that is available to us all of the time because of the cross. But the Lord didn't just save us that we might have fellowship. He saved us also that we might serve him. See, that light that we get to walk in, it's also a light that shines through us. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A town built on a city cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. How ridiculous would that be? To take your flashlight, turn it on, and then stick a bowl over it. How's that working out? You can't see anything. It's dumb. Jesus said, don't do that. He said, instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light so everybody in the house can see. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Lord has a work for us to do. He says, I want you to go out and invite others into this relationship that you also enjoy. He called you to something greater than yourself as we enjoy relationship with him who is greater than we are. The thing I love about this passage, again, 4,000 years old, 2,000 years before Jesus was ever born. But the message is the same. This is before the Bible was ever even written. Uh, Elihu uh, said these things. These words were written down. And it is amazingly spot on accurate. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. He doesn't. And he desired a relationship with Adam and Eve in the beginning, and he desires a relationship with you today. And I would say to you that maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but there's things that have kind of crept into your life that you know ought not to be there. Things that are a hindrance to your walk with the Lord, that stand between you and him having an intimate relationship. I would say, let today be that day where you just let it go, where you confess your sin, where you turn from your sin and turn towards God. That's what God wants for you. It's what he wanted for Adam and Eve. That's what he wants for us, that relationship. He wants you to turn from your sin and turn towards him that you might enjoy that intimate relationship. And so I'd say, man, if there's those things, and you'll know, the Lord puts it on your heart. We do a good job at covering it up and pretending like, oh, it's okay. But those things that are there that stand between you and the Lord, man, give those things up today. Just surrender them to the Lord because they're not going to bring you any sort of satisfaction or joy anyway. Only the Lord can do that. Uh, maybe all of this relationship talk, you're like, dude, this is foreign to me. I, I don't know about all that. Man, today is the day of salvation. And today believe that Jesus is God, that he left his throne in heaven, that he came to earth, that he lived the perfect life and that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose three days later. And the Bible says that you will be saved. Let that journey begin today. Be born again in your spirit. Go before the Lord and, and pray. Either way, boy, remove those things. Say, I give it up. Lord, I want what you have for me and walk in all that the Lord has for you. It's available. You see, and, and we're getting ready to take communion, and that's what I love about the Lord is his availability. And he showed just how available he was in communion. You remember when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples and he instituted the Lord's Supper, what we call communion? Jesus didn't go out and buy caviar and the most expensive bottle of you know, champagne that he could find and say, hey, when you do this, make sure that you buy the best stuff because you're remembering somebody who's super awesome and then do this in remembrance of me. No, Jesus took the common things, the wine and the bread, the things that were at every table. They may have been all that you had at your table if you were poor, but they would be at your table. If you were wealthy, boy, it might just be something that was there, but it was at your table. And Jesus said, these things that are common, that are available to every person, take them and remember what I've done. See, the Lord desires that relationship with you. He's made it available to you. Now, here's the thing with communion. If you're not a Christian this morning, you shouldn't partake of communion. Because what we're doing when we take communion, we're saying, Lord, I remember what you've done for me. Thank you so much. If you haven't trusted in the Lord, it's hypocritical to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to just enjoy this cracker and juice. And I'll just tell you right now, it's not that delicious to begin with. <laughs> it, it, it means something amazing by faith. The good news is, 
that it's available to you. That you can just say, Lord, I'm done. I've come to the end of myself. I want to be forgiven of my sin. And you can be saved and you can enjoy that. And so as we go to the Lord's table, as JT and Jessica come up to lead us in one final song, man, go before the Lord. Ask him to just reset you as a believer. Ask him to put his finger on those things that just got to go. And then in faith, confess those and walk away from them and don't ever look back and enjoy the fellowship intimately with the Lord. If you've never surrendered to God, man, today is the day of salvation. Be born again. The world's got nothing. I'm telling you, I've been there. Walk in all the Lord has for you this day. And so, Lord, we thank you so much, God, for your body that, that represents, or for the bread, pardon me, that represents your body. Lord, that it reminds us that you paid the price that we should have. Lord, that you didn't wink at our sin or turn a blind eye, but Lord, you paid for it in full. Lord, thank you for your blood that was shed that's represented in the juice. Lord, it reminds us that we've been born again, that we've been regenerate, regenerated. Lord, that, that the old has passed away and all things have become new. That we're no longer bound to our sin, Lord, but we're bound to your glory, to your righteousness. Lord, I pray that as we come to your table this morning, Lord, that we would just be recalibrated, that you would just readjust us, that you would, that you would realign our focus. It's so easy for us, God, to take and focus on the little things, on work and family and kids and, and issues, and, and those are all good and important, but Lord, compared to you, they pale in comparison. And the reality is, is when we get our priorities in order, when you, we make you first, everything else has a way of working itself out. So, Lord, just recalibrate us this morning. Refocus us. Help us to fix our eyes on you in glory and all that you've done, thereby rejoicing in who we are now as a result. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for all you're doing, all you've done, and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All the words. 
Yes, Lord, uh, that song says it all. We just praise you for what you've done, and we thank you. In your name, Jesus, amen. 